Today, we're gonna talk about why doing nothing is the most important thing you can do. Now, this may sound kind of bizarre because you're sitting there thinking, well, I do a lot of nothing. And in fact, my problem is that I do way too much nothing. And instead, I need to be doing something. But it turns out that scientifically, there are different kinds of nothing. And we tend to do the wrong kinds of nothing. And there are actually certain kinds of literally inaction that lead to positive outcomes in our life. Now, this may sound weird, but just hear me out. So right now, we live in a world that is going to hell. There's climate change problems, inflation problems, dating and gender dynamics are a mess. Like people are under the age of 30 are mostly living with their parents. There's like wars and stuff going on. The world is an absolute mess. So as human beings, when we are faced with absolute messes, we do particular things. And it turns out that the things that we do when we are faced with problems actually create more problems than they solve. As a simple example, let's say I have a final that's coming up at the end of the week and I'm terrified that I'm not going to do well. So what do I end up doing in order to deal with this problem? I end up spending a lot of time playing video games or binge watching shows or maybe even getting drunk or something like that. So it is the way that I try to solve my problems that actually creates additional problems. It would be one thing if I just didn't do anything all day long, but even the things that I choose to engage in, like let's say I do get drunk or go to a party or something like that, mean that I'm hungover the next day, which means that studying for the test is actually harder. The most common experience that I hear from people today is despite the fact that they're swimming really hard, everyone is still drowning. Despite the fact that you are trying to stay afloat, the harder you seem to work, the worse things become. And then what ends up happening is people feel incredibly burnt out. So today what we're going to do is figure out how to completely reevaluate that cycle and paradoxically do less, but in the right way. So this sort of idea actually comes from some really interesting research around coping mechanisms. So coping mechanisms are things that we do when something is not going right. So when I have a problem, the way that I manage that problem is the way that I cope. And recently what I've heard, especially in the field of like psychiatry and therapy and even just like the internet is everyone's like, level up your coping mechanisms, bruh. Like I need to be able to cope. Like I need my copium. Like, oh my God, like everyone needs to be meditating and exercising and spending time in nature. And like, these are the healthy coping mechanisms. And instead of what we need to do is get rid of the unhealthy coping mechanisms. I need to be meditating instead of watching porn and jerking off. Well, it ain't that easy, right? And so today what we're actually going to teach you is a little bit better of a way to deal with your problems with actually doing less because that's actually the most powerful coping mechanism. I know it sounds crazy, but hear me out. Let's start with the worst form of coping, which is called emotion-focused coping. So emotion-focused coping is when something goes wrong out there, it creates an internal change in here. So if I am, you know, for example, if I have that test and I feel afraid, what I'm going to sort of focus on is not fixing the problem out there, but managing my internal emotional state. This is called emotion-focused coping. And what we sort of know from studies in psychology, psychiatry, coping mechanisms, especially things like trauma, is that the worst kind of coping mechanisms are actually emotion-focused coping. Emotion-focused coping mechanisms actually lead to poor outcomes over the long term. So what that means more practically is if I solve my problems or if the way I deal with my problems, because I'm not really solving them, or to actually change my internal emotional state, that actually doesn't fix any problems and is going to lead to worse problems later on. So let's just think about this, right? So let's say I have a test I'm studying for or supposed to be studying for. And instead, I feel incredibly anxious and fearful that I'm not going to do well on the test. I really need an A. I really need an A. And what do I do with all of that fear and anxiety? I turn to something like video games or pornography or alcohol or marijuana or whatever, something to manage my internal emotional state. There are also other examples of this. So let's say you're in a relationship with someone who is very, very dependent on your emotional support, or maybe you're the one who needs emotional support. And then anytime you feel negative emotions in here, your goal is to make those negative emotions go away. Now, this is a huge problem nowadays, especially with things like trigger warnings. Now, I'm not completely against trigger warnings. There's some evidence that they're a little bit harmful, but 
let's just understand this, okay? So what goes on with a trigger warning? What goes on with a trigger warning is you say something that makes me feel a, a particular way. We're not saying talking about hate speech or anything, but you say something, oh my God, you are talking about exercising and that triggers my trauma about when I last went to the gym. So in this situation, what is this person doing? They're saying that you should stop doing what you're doing to try to control my internal emotional state. The worst problem here is that we are surrendering the power of our internal emotional state to other people. But at the end of the day, all of these are emotion-focused coping. And the purpose of emotion-focused coping is to fix the emotions that are caused by problems. So what happens when we use emotion-focused coping? At the best, nothing changes, right? Because I'm managing my emotions, but I'm not solving the problems that actually create them. And at the worst, when I engage in emotion-focused coping, it actually impairs me when I try to solve my problems. I'm more hungover. Now it's been a week since I've studied and I forgot something. So even though I've sort of delayed by seven days, I'm actually forgetting something each one of those days. And so what we sort of know of the science of emotion-focused coping is that people who rely on it tend to do poorly. So if we don't want to do emotion-focused coping, what's the other option? So now we move to standard copium. And standard copium, the most common example of this is something like problem solving. So as we already said, you know, I have a couple of ways of dealing with my problems. One is that I can try to manage my emotions and not actually deal with the problem. And the second is I can actually deal with the problem. And the cool thing is when we focus on problem solving as a coping mechanism, the data shows that we tend to do better. Right? No surprise that people who fix their problems tend to do better in life. So here I am telling you, oh, just go problem solve and just fix your problems. And this is where we run into a really important problem with problem solving, which is if you are listening to this video right now, you've already figured it out, which is that you can't solve all your problems. Right? Because, hey, the world is going to hell. Everything is screwed up. Climate change and inflation, all the other crap that I said. I haven't been able to go on a date in two years. I've never had a girlfriend. All the men I, d I date are toxic. And all these kinds of problems exist out there. And these are unsolvable problems. And so then what do we do? We decide to give up. So this is the other problem with problem solving. Is if the mind cannot clearly see a path to problem solve, we will go ahead and give up. And that is exactly the wrong thing to do. Because as it turns out, trying to solve unsolvable problems is one of the most useful things you can do. This may sound insane, but hear me out. So I'm going to tell you all the story. So when I was an intern, I had a patient who had stage four metastatic liver cancer. So this means that they had cancer of the liver and it had spread all throughout their body. So this person was going to die. And his family would come in every day and they would be freaking out. We'd sort of explain to this person and his family what the diagnosis is. You've got maybe about a month to live, right? That's like, it's like one of these bad scenarios. And the family was like, they, since he's got liver cancer, so the liver is like up here and then it presses on the stomach. It's, it metastasizes. So it's all in his abdomen and it's a, his intestines and stomach and stuff like that. So what is he doing? He's not eating. And then the family gets really, really bent out of shape about this. They're like, oh my God, he has to keep his strength up. He's not eating anything. You got to get him to eat. Like we're trying to get him to eat. He needs to eat. He needs to eat. He needs to keep his strength up. And I'm sitting there in the back and I'm kind of thinking like, bro, what are y'all talking about? Like he doesn't, strength ain't going to make a difference. The guy is like terminally ill with cancer. Like this isn't going to work. And so this was back when I was an intern, right? So this was before I became a psychiatrist. And I realized, I didn't realize at the time that we're missing out on something really, really important which is that when we try to problem solve, there are two mechanisms actually at play. One is we are trying to solve the problem. And if we can fix our external circumstances, then we will sort of get better, right? Our lives will get better objectively because we fix something. But there's a second aspect to problem solving, which is incredibly important and has nothing to do with, with whether the problem gets solved or not. And that is the mental aspect of problem solving. So in the case of this family, what they were doing is doing anything they could. And the cool thing about that is that anything that they can do, even if it's completely irrelevant in the long run, changes their psychology. So if we look at it in the face of unsolvable problems, there are two options. One is we can try to do something futile, and then at least we're giving it, you know, we're trying something. We're giving it some effort that we've got. Or what we can do is give up. And now this is the beautiful thing when it comes to long-term outcomes and people who use coping mechanisms and stuff like that, there's one big difference that people who try 
do way better than people who give up. And so the other really bizarre thing is that frequently when we give up, we also have a cognitive bias at play. And our mind tells us there is no point in trying because we are doomed to failure. But that isn't objectively correct, especially if you look at something like dating or whatever. There, there's so many people that I've talked to who have said, yeah, this is objectively hopeless. Everything is a mess. Look at all this evidence that I have from the internet and people talking on the internet and people posting things on shorts and Twitter or X or whatever it is nowadays. And look at all of this evidence. And I have my own experience of trying to go on dates three or four times. And everyone says, right, because let's remember that the internet is scientific research. Those two are absolutely interchangeable. When we're sort of faced in that situation, we tend to give up. And so I know it sounds crazy, but even in the face of unsolvable problems, I strongly encourage you to give it a shot. And don't worry about your mind telling you this will never work. That's not what we're actually shooting for. When we're trying to solve an unsolvable problem, the goal is not to actually solve the problem, but there's a decent chance you'll make an impact of some kind. The goal is mentally to not give up. The goal is to mentally understand that if you can put forth some effort, even if it's futile, it changes the equation of mental burnout in your mind. So this is kind of what copium is all about. We absolutely want to try to solve our problems, but even in the face of unsolvable problems, you should still give it a shot. Because human beings at the end of the day, when they do something, they feel like they're doing something, right? So people will kind of say, oh, you know, uh, I prayed to whoever, right? I prayed to God, and because I prayed to God, this person's life was saved. And I'm not trying to dock on prayer or say God exists or doesn't exist or anything like that. I'm just pointing out that the psychology of doing something makes people feel like a little bit more responsible and take a little bit more credit if things are moving in the right direction. So we absolutely want to give things a shot. And then we move to the top tier of coping mechanisms, which is what I would dub hopium, which is the super cool because the top tier of coping mechanisms that leads to the best outcomes in life actually involves doing absolutely nothing. And this tier of coping mechanism is called cognitive reframing. Cognitive reframing is literally changing the way that you think about things. And I know it sounds insane, but I've worked with a lot of people who are like degenerate gamers and a lot of people who are super successful, like CEOs and like streamers and stuff like that. And what I've, uh, the really bizarre thing is that I don't think that there's a big difference between these two groups of people. Hell, in my life, the big difference, like I was the same person I was like 15 years ago as to now. What really changed? My IQ didn't change. It's not like my conscientiousness magically increased. What changed was the way that I think about things, which is technically doing nothing. And so cognitive reframing is one of the most important tools that you can actually harness. So let's understand this a little bit better, okay? So you can take two different people who encounter the same scenario. Let's say they go through a breakup. And literally, we've done scientific studies on the way that people respond to breakups. And what we've found is that the way that they think determines their outcomes over time. So if I break, if I break up with someone, I can think to myself, oh my God, I'm unlovable and I will be alone for the rest of my life. And this person is going to do so much better without me. And there's no hope for me, right? So we went through a breakup. They dumped me, didn't dump me, whatever. You can pick whatever scenario you want. And on the flip side, we have people who are good at cognitive reframing. And these people literally take their initial thoughts and try to move them in a different direction. And you can even acknowledge the negativity. Wow, I got dumped. That means that, you know, I'm really not in a good place right now. I really have a lot of work to do if I want to become a healthy person who can engage in a healthy relationship. Even though this relationship fell apart, at the least, I learned a lot from it, and I will be better prepared to engage in future relationships. So this is literally what cognitive reframing is. And this is what we do in psychotherapy, is that we take people's default thoughts, and what we actually try to help them do is reframe to more helpful thoughts. And so it's not enough that I just tell y'all, hey, just start thinking differently, bruh. So there's a, a particular process that I'm going to walk y'all through like a, you know, a quick rundown of how to cognitively reframe. Hey, just a quick note. A lot of people will ask us, what do I do next? And that's why we built Dr. K's guide. 
It's a comprehensive resource that distills over 20 years of my experience, both as a monk and as a psychiatrist. And it's designed in a way that's tailored to fit your needs. So if you're interested in better understanding your mind and taking control of your life, check out the link below. So the first thing to do if you want to cognitively reframe is you want to write down whatever your initial thoughts are. So you're going to have all of these kinds of like negative thoughts that kind of come out and just write them down, right? And then ask yourself, this is kind of a degen technique, okay? Ask yourself if you were a different human being, if you were a more resilient human being, if you were a better human being, if you were one of like one of those people who's like good at life, right? Instead of you. What would they think about the situation? You know, those dumbasses that are trying to encourage you and get you back up and stuff like that. They're like, oh, man, like, think about the big picture. Like, what would they say? And what you're going to find is that there is an instinctive revulsion to that second column. What you're going to find is as you write things down, your mind will naturally react by countering those kinds of things. But here's the crazy thing. Just because your mind has a reaction doesn't mean that it's true. And so then what you want to do is notice that third reaction, right, which is the conflict between column one and column two. Just how do you feel when you're trying to write down the second column and write those things down? This is absurd. This doesn't work for me. This works for other people, but is not going to apply in my case. You're going to recognize all these kinds of thoughts and just jot them down. Then take a deep breath and just ask yourself out of the second column, which is the hopeful column, right, which is the cognitive reframe column. Which of these things, because you can't accept all of them, but is there a single one that you can somewhat sort of accept, right? So you take these five things and which one is the least offensive, is the least incorrect? And just circle that one and just spend a little bit of time thinking about it. And then ask yourself, okay, why can I accept this one? After you pick your one, just ask yourself, okay, what is it about this one that makes it okay? Well, at the end of the day, like, I know technically any breakup that I go through, I will have learned something. I'll have gotten better at breaking up. I'm managing my emotions. It's like pushing me to do a little bit better in this way, in this way, in this way. And so something beautiful happens the second you start doing that is that you have actually cognitively reframed. You've literally rewired your neurons a little bit because what we know about thinking is that thinking happens in patterns. So anytime you see a particular thing, your mind will evoke the same thoughts, right? So like, in my case, you know, like I was just thinking about one of my kids and one of my kids doesn't like mayo. So the first question she asks anytime she sees a sandwich is, is there mayo on it? Every time there's a sandwich, it triggers some kind of response. And in my case, it's like whenever I eat something sweet, I'm like, wow, I like this. It's not too sweet. So you may have noticed that you say the same damn shit over and over and over again, or people that you know say the same damn shit over and over and over again. And that's because our neurons have been well wired in that way. So if we want to start thinking differently, literally what we have to do is push this up, this boulder uphill of positive thoughts. And it will feel very, very cumbersome when we first do it. The beautiful thing is that if you engage in this cognitively reframing technique over and over and over again, your mind will literally start to change. The natural responses that you have when you get a setback will be a little bit different. You'll be able to look on the brighter side of things. And once you're able to look on the brighter side of things, that's the first domino. Because now you're not in despair. Now you're not burnt out. Now you're not giving up at the first setback. And even if we sort of think about these terms, what is the difference between giving up in a setback? It's just whether you keep going or not, right? A setback, which is your last setback, is when you give up. But if you don't give up after a setback, it automatically becomes a setback. And so then the question you need to ask yourself is, what do you want your life to be? Do you want to be a person who gives up or has setbacks? And that's the big difference between a D-Gen gamer and a CEO. One of them gives up and one of them has setbacks. So I know it sounds kind of crazy, but it turns out that a lot of what we do when we are faced with problems actually creates more problems. This is why doing nothing is actually everything. But there are different kinds of nothing. And the most important nothing that you can do is the nothing up here. The interesting thing is if you really pay attention, most of y'all, when you say, I do nothing, you're not actually doing nothing. You're doing something, right? I have a test at the end of the week. Are you literally doing nothing? No, you start doing crap. You start doing dumb crap, right? You start watching TV or you're on YouTube right now, procrastinating from doing the work that you're doing by watching this fucking video. This is not doing nothing. You are doing something. You are watching me right now. And that's the crazy thing. 
is that what we sort of found is that people who focus on doing something that makes them feel better, mopium or emotion-focused coping, or even problem-solving are not as Chad or Stacy as people who actually do a little bit less or do way less, but do that less in a very particular way, which is cognitively reframing and not giving up. This is normally the part of the video where I would say, now go out and do something. But actually, maybe you should do nothing.